Hello, and welcome to the Cambridge PhD Casts. Today I'm speaking to Eleanor Giraud, who's a PhD student in the Faculty of Music here at Cambridge. So Eleanor is going to introduce us to her research. Eleanor, if you'd like to give us a brief introduction. Sure. Well, I'm studying the production and notation of Dominican manuscripts in 13th century Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, the Dominicans were, um, they are a Catholic religious order mm -hmm. founded by St. Dominic in the early 13th century, hence the name Dominicans. Mm -hmm. And um, Dom Dominic's vision was to create an order of brothers who would be very well educated and thus they would be able to preach very well mm -hmm. and in doing so they'd be able to convert heretics to Christianity. The Dominican order grew very quickly. In 1217 there was just Dominic and his 16 followers. They spread across Europe establishing convents and by 1222 there was um, over a thousand members of the order. Mm -hmm. uh, they came to lots of different places. They settled here in Cambridge mm -hmm. and uh, one of the other places they had a large convent was Paris. Mm -hmm. Now, 13th century Paris. Yes, tell is, us a little bit about it. Um, it was the home for the French king and the royal court. And it was also the site of a very eminent university. Uh, the University of Paris was at the forefront of studies in, theolo in theology. And that attracted masters and students to come to the university from across Europe. And of course, it attracted the Dominicans as well. Mm -hmm. And with so many students and masters in Paris, the town was able to support a very, um, uh, a very good book trade. Mm -hmm. um, it was a thriving community of uh, professionals who made their living from copying books or uh, decorating books, these kind of, the different aspects involved with book production. Mm -hmm. Of course, the book trade didn't just cater to the university, it also catered to the needs of um, religious institutions in Paris and to the royal court and other individuals. Mm -hmm. When you say this, so this is about the production and annotation of liturgical manuscripts. Yes. Um, would you like to introduce us a little bit to what you mean by liturgical manuscripts, first of all, and then we can talk about processes of production and annotation. Sure. So uh, by the liturgy, I mean the uh, communal services that would have happened uh, every day in religious institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, the main one would be mass mm -hmm. and then you also have the offices which included um, things like vespers, compline and so on. Mm -hmm. And liturgical books uh, contain the material uh, which details what you were to do in the mass or in the offices. Mm -hmm. Different books had different functions so some of them would have been the ones used by the celebrant mm -hmm. um, and others would have been <coughs> books used in the choir and so on. Mm -hmm. So they kind of choreograph the entirety of services across a day, in particular feast days. And... Yes, it goes through each day, but then it, it goes through the, the liturgical year, starting in Advent and going all the way through to the end of November. Fantastic. So with regard to the production of annotation, you kind of painted a picture of this vibrant community and this vibrant book trade in 13th century Paris. Mm -hmm. Would you like to give us a bit of an idea, and obviously we'll go into detail in a moment, but what's actually involved in the production and annotation of manuscripts like these? You start off with parchment. Mm -hmm. um, you would have had several pieces of parchment which would have been folded in half to make a little booklet, which mm -hmm. was called a gathering or a choir, um, or that's what we call them today. Mm -hmm. Within that parchment, they would designate a certain area within which they would write. Mm -hmm. To do this, uh, they would prick little holes in the edge of the parchment mm -hmm. and then between these holes um, draw rule lines so that they could delim delineate the space in which they were going to work. Mm -hmm. And they would also often prick and rule lines for mm -hmm. every text line. Okay. Um, so that was your first step. Mm -hmm. You've then got your writing area set out mm -hmm. and uh, you could copy text into that. You'd first of all copy the text that's in black and then you might go back and add um, extra information such as rubrics, mm -hmm. which would often be in red. Mm -hmm. Following the text copying, uh, if the book was to have music in it, the text scribe would have had to have late left space for the music. Mm -hmm. The music goes in on, um, at this time anyway in Paris, it would have been written on four red stave lines. Mm -hmm. uh, so they would have been drawn before the music went in because you have to put the music on top of them. And then uh, after that, you would have the decoration of the manuscript. Mm -hmm. If there was going to be any um, gold used, then that would have been done first because the process in which um, you put gold onto the parchment uh, involved some scraping after you'd put it on to uh, get the area 
uh, to have gold only on the areas that you wanted it. Mm. So you'd do gold first and then you'd do other colours. Okay. And of course you'd have had to have, the text scribe would also have had to have left space for the artwork to go in. Mm. Usually this would be um, the first letter of um, a sentence or mm -hmm. something that would be uh, done in uh, different colours or decorated in gold and so on. So what we're left is this idea of a, a remarkably intricate process but also one that I think interestingly kind of involves a whole community of people yes. working on the same so text scribes and music scribes and then illustrators as well. In some cases these would all be done by different people, different specialists, mm -hmm. but of course you also have books where one person would have been able to do, would have done the lot. Mm -hmm. um, in those cases you might not find, um, they might not be as say skilled in doing decoration or something, mm -hmm. but um, you do have books that were written by just one person mm -hmm. and not um, not done by a community. But the community is what's happening in Paris okay. um, and available in Paris at least. Before we get down to the specifics of these particular manuscripts that you work with, mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about why they were produced? Sure. As I mentioned earlier, the Dominican order uh, spread across Europe mm -hmm. and established convents in lots of different places. And when they did so, they adopted the uh, local practices for their liturgical celebrations. This meant that in Paris, for example, the convent of Saint-Jacques, the Dominican convent there, adopted um, some of the Parisian uh, practices in their celebration of the liturgy. And somewhere else, say in Bologna, uh, they adopted Bolognese practices. Mm -hmm. And this created difficulties because when, um, when the Dominican brothers moved from place to place, they were quite a mobile order. Mm -hmm. um, they would move for the purposes of preaching or for studies or administrative duties and so on. Uh, when they did move, they would have to um, adjust to a different uh, different liturgical practices. Mm -hmm. It would just be a, a bit of a, uh, of a hassle to do. Yeah. And also when uh, Dominicans gathered from different parts of the uh, of the order, as they did every year, they had a yearly meeting. Mm -hmm. And then it became very evident that they, they all had their own ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. So it was decided that um, the Dominican order would establish a single uniform liturgy for the entire order. It took some time for this to actually come about. There were a few attempts that were not at all well received. Uh, there were a few uh, complaints, rather numerous complaints in fact, but um, eventually the Dominican order made constitutional a revision that was uh, completed by Humbert of Romans, mm -hmm. who was the Master General of the Order mm -hmm. um, at that time. Mm -hmm. He, the head of the Order, mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's in what year? Uh, in 1256. Mm -hmm. um, he was made head of the Order in 1254, mm -hmm. and in that same year he uh, took on the task of revising the liturgy, mm -hmm. um, taking over from people before him. And uh, in 1256 he announced that his liturgy was complete. He asked everyone to um, accept it even if they didn't completely agree with it. <laughs> it's a good trick, I should learn that. And as a, mean to, as a means to disseminate the, um, the liturgy across the entire order, mm -hmm. they produced several large exemplars. Uh, these are big sort of master copy books mm -hmm. um, which contained um, several individual books within them each of which addressed um, a different part of the liturgy. So, for example, um, one book had all the gospel readings mm -hmm. for Mass, one had all the epistle readings for Mass, one had all the chants for Mass, uh, one had instructions and chants for processing. Mm -hmm. So, um, And there were 14 books in total within each exemplar. Mm -hmm. We don't quite know how many exemplars were made. Um, we know that in 1256, uh, the... Um, the order asked for each of the 12 geographical provinces to send £20 uh, to contribute towards the cost of making communal exemplars. So there may well have been 12 made, for the, one for each province, mm -hmm. or maybe slightly less. Mm -hmm. That's uh, debated. <laughs> okay, so because presumably not all survive. No, today there are three that are left. Mm -hmm. Um, one is um, now held in Rome, but that was originally um, the exemplar that was kept in the convent of Saint-Jacques in Paris. That's the most complete and the oldest of the exemplars that survives. Um, a second exemplar 
um, survives in Salamanca. It was the exemplar for the province of Spain. Mm -hmm. And uh, sadly, it's very um, fragmentary. Mm -hmm. Of the 14 books, only four survive today. But luckily for my studies, all four of them contain chants. So oh. I've got lots of notation for me to look at. Um, and the third exemplar uh, is in London, mm -hmm. in the British Library. So it's very easy to go and have a, have a look at it. Mm -hmm. That exemplar is actually... It was made for the Master General of the Order as a personal copy, which mm -hmm. he could have uh, taken with him on his visits around the Order in order to make sure everyone knew what mm. the correct version was. So to check against it. correct practice. Yes, to... exactly. So the Rome manuscript and the Salamancan manuscript are both very large manuscripts. The Rome one is kind of... Um, about I think it's about 50 by 35 centimeters approximately mm -hmm. and it's um, it's very heavy it weighs about 17 kilos oh, wow. okay. um, the London manuscript is um, about the same length in folios but it weighs just two and a quarter kilos it's yeah. much smaller it's um, made with much finer parchment and mm -hmm. this was so that the um, master general could take it yeah, around it's with actually him. a portable kind of yes thing. there are no longer straps attached to the manuscript but I've read that um, in even up to about the 1960s there were straps attached to this manuscript so it could have been carried a bit like a rucksack apparently. Oh, wow. That's an amazing image. <laughs> yeah. So you've introduced us to these three key sources for your mm -hmm. own research and um, would you like to tell us a little bit more about what it is that you were looking for when you look at these uh, these manuscripts? Sure, um, well I'm interested in looking at um, how um, music manuscripts were made mm -hmm. and by whom. So I'm looking at these three sources and asking uh, questions about um, how many notators were involved, how many people were copying the music, mm -hmm. um, who were they, can we find out who they, you know, whether they were professionals, whether they were Dominican brothers, mm -hmm. um, and also how do they and their work fit into the larger pattern of how the three exemplars were made. Mm -hmm. These three exemplars provide an interesting group to study for those questions because um, first of all the fact that there's 14 different books within each manuscript or there would have been um, makes their contents quite complex mm -hmm. and this would have re um, required a lot of organisation and forethought and planning mm -hmm. going into the production process. Secondly, the fact that the three manuscripts were intended to be identical, mm -hmm. whether they are or not is another matter, <laughs> um, it makes it them quite comparable and mm -hmm. it's easy to tell um, you know, where things are different in terms of content, in terms of presentation, production processes and so on. Mm -hmm. And finally, the three manuscripts were all made in Paris um, within a very short time span, probably of about five or six years, maybe a little bit longer. Um, so we might expect that um, they would have been made by the same people and with the same processes. Um, and I can see, I can try and find out what, to what extent this is true, what, mm -hmm. what extent do they have standard practices and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think before we before we get into your specific findings, mm -hmm. I think it, it would be interesting to hear a little bit more about how you actually do that kind of that kind of analysis. Because I mean, when someone like myself looks at manuscripts like these, I can't tell hands apart. I can't, you know, so how do you actually approach them in such a way as to pick out the various contributors and contributions and things like this? What I do myself is I um, choose the various different elements of the notation when I'm looking at notation in particular. Mm -hmm. And um, I try and copy exactly what the, what I see on the page mm -hmm. and try and build up a picture of what each notator typically drew mm -hmm. as a way of getting into understanding what were their normal strokes, what were their normal pen movements. Mm -hmm. And I do that for you know the different clefts and for the different note shapes and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, sort of build up a sort of a biography almost of each uh, notator and that gives me a way of being able to tell where um, notators where there are changes in notator mm -hmm. and um, and so I've been able to identify how many notators are working in the books. Picking out those kind of idiosyncrasies that attach to particular notators I think is, is absolutely fascinating it's the kind of thing that requires such an eye for detail which yes, is, 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 is amazing and to, to do it so um, so closely with these manuscripts as well. Um, do you want to maybe tell us a little bit more about what you found through doing this kind of this kind of research? Across my three exemplars, 
I've identified uh, 16 different notators, mm -hmm. um, of which only one appears in more than one manuscript. Mm -hmm. So that's already quite a lot of notators working in Paris. Um, and it suggests to us that there was probably a ready supply mm -hmm. of people who were able to notate. The one person who comes up in both manuscripts, it's, uh, it's interesting that he actually copies the same thing in both manuscripts. Mm -hmm. I had a closer look at what he was copying and uh, this is what uh, was called a tabula mm -hmm. and it was um, a formula that they used, the Dominicans used, to assign uh, weekly duties to different brothers. So, um, brother John will be the deacon and mm -hmm. so on. They um, had a notated formula which they sang these instructions to. Oh, wow. A song wrote it. Yes. This is amazing. This is, uh, can be seen in the Rome manuscript and in the, in, and the London manuscript, mm -hmm. not in the Salamancan manuscript which has books missing. Which is missing, yeah. Um, and the task of assigning the tabula, doing the rotor, was that of the cantor. Mm -hmm. So I suspect that it was the Dominican cantor who copied um, this specific part of mm -hmm. the... The bit that he would have known. The bit that he was, knew himself. Yeah. And the cantor would have been somebody who was also quite involved with music making in the convent. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting to note that his uh, hand, if this is his hand as I suspect, doesn't appear elsewhere in the uh, in the exemplars. He's only copying this small passage mm -hmm. related to the tabula and not any of the any of the other large passages mm -hmm. of chant. So he's restricted entirely to that. Yes. Okay. You've introduced us to the role of the uh, the role of this cantor who mm -hmm. appears to have been uh, possibly transcribing particular parts. Mm -hmm. um, now he's a Dominican brother doing some some notation and transcription. Is is it common for brothers to be involved in this? Um, I think there are. I've got two answers to your <laughs> question. Uh, first of all. We know that uh, one Dominican brother would have been the overseer of scribes mm -hmm. and this brother had the role of selecting uh, scribes who, ha who were of good, re good reputation, mm -hmm. um, making sure they were properly fed, uh, providing them with parchment and uh, paying them. Mm -hmm. So from this description we can be fairly sure that uh, the overseer of scribes was hiring in professional scribes so from, from, outside. from outside of the convent um, and he also had to make sure that the scribes didn't mix with the brothers. Oh, I see. <laughs> so this is obviously talking about scribes who would have been copying text but I think it probably can apply to the notators as well. I think mm -hmm. most of the notation was done by professionals who were brought in mm -hmm. uh, because um, they had this notation that was very fluid and consistent and regular. Mm -hmm. That said, there are a few small passages, um, in particularly in the Rome uh, exemplar and the London exemplar, which um, are written in a very clumsy, awkward notational hand. Mm -hmm. um, these may well have been done by Dominican brothers, partly because the notation is not very good, mm -hmm. partly because they're copying very small passages, so maybe one or two staves, and it seems strange to bring in, hire in somebody to only copy a few a few notes, mm -hmm. essentially. And thirdly, the passages that they're copying are often specialised um, chants or obscure little bits that, uh, that were not part of the larger body of chant. So uh, again, these might have been done by um, the Dominicans who actually would have sung these small sections. Mm -hmm. That said, I think the larger part of the notation um, would have been done by professionals. Okay, so having got having got now a picture of you know, these fascinating um, sources themselves, and then maybe the ways in which they were put together, and um, I suppose I'd like to ask what you found in, in in your own research. That's kind of what have you what are you bringing that's new to the field? I think my research first of all shows that um, there was a large and ready supply of professional notators mm -hmm. available in Paris, and that the Dominicans did they didn't feel um, 
well, it seems like they didn't have a particular loyalty to a, a certain group. They weren't bringing the same people back to do each exemplar. Mm -hmm. This may mean that the exemplars were actually being copied simultaneously. Um, but from the dating of the texts, it seems like this wasn't the case. They were probably copied um, slightly one and after the other. Mm -hmm. So it does seem like um, there were lots of people to choose from and they could bring them whoever in they wanted to. Mm -hmm. And this is something that's not really been investigated before. Mm -hmm. um, as a side aspect to uh, looking at notation, I have been able to work out a way of um, how to identify different notators. Mm -hmm. And um, this is also a definite contribution to uh, current scholarship because to date, square notation has not received as much attention as other forms of early notation, mm -hmm. um, particularly square notation for chant. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the the methodology that I've def developed to be able to identify and distinguish uh, square chant notators will be something that people can use um, across the centuries, hopefully, mm -hmm. when square chant That's notation was used yeah. for you know, four or five centuries. Mm -hmm. And people hopefully will be able to find the methodology I've u developed useful. Oh, fantastic. It's a um, much wider application. Yes, I hope so, at <laughs> least. <laughs> And finally, um, the three uh, exemplars have been uh, studied to different extents um, in isolation, mm -hmm. but not looked at as a, as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, the Rome manuscript has see, received a lot of attention because it was um, for a long time thought to be the original manuscript made by Humbert of Romans. Mm -hmm. um, it's now been shown that this is not quite the case. It was made slightly after 1256. Mm -hmm but it's still the oldest one and for that reason it's received um, a fair amount Quite of attention. Of, yeah. The one that's in the British Library has also received some attention, uh, I think because it's very accessible. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to have a letter of introduction, but you can, anyone can go and visit it in London. Mm -hmm. It would be fair to say that that's not exactly the case with... In Rome? Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, but, and then the Salamancan exemplar has been uh, completely withdrawn from any access for a long period of time and only recently have been, people been able to see it. Mm. Um, before, uh, in the last decade, there have been three or four articles that have been written about it. But before then, there was only one two-page article written in the 1920s, mm -hmm. uh, just briefly describing the contents of the Salamancan exemplar. So it's bringing these three texts together, together. and doing a study on all three seems yes. to have and seeing what patterns emerge from the three of them. It seems to have brought together a whole lot of really exciting uh, new new ideas as uh -huh. well. So one of the things we like to do when we're talking to PhD students is to get an idea of what it is that you know that gets you to study um, a, a topic like this. So, okay, so yeah. what was it that led you to this topic? As an undergraduate, I was uh, drawn towards studies with studying sources. Mm -hmm. um, I worked on a, a project where I had to uh, find the sources for a particular t liturgical service. It was for Vespers the day before Easter. Um, and I was given a time and a location and I had to work out um, uh, what would have been sung and transcribe it and oh. translate all the Latin. So I, from that I got hooked into um, working with uh, primary sources in this way. For this particular topic, um, my supervisor, Susan Rankin, uh, spotted that uh, the London exemplar and another Dominican manuscript now in Philadelphia. These have both got artwork attributed to um, a particular illuminator, a particular artist, uh, who we now call Johann Grusch. Uh, that's not his, their name, but that's <laughs> just what we've called them. Um, it wasn't Susan who uh, identified this illuminator. She just noticed that these two manuscripts were both Dominican. Mm -hmm. This Grusch uh, artist or group of artists um, also illuminated a very famous uh, Parisian manuscript of polyphony, mm -hmm. music for uh, several voices, that has received a lot of attention. Um, so uh, that got us thinking about um, what are the connections between music manuscripts in Paris mm -hmm. um, that are illuminated by the same people? Mm -hmm. Are there connections between the notation and so on? And as I started looking further at uh, different sources, I noticed that a lot of the, um, there were a lot of connections between Dominican sources. So instead of um, 
looking at music manuscripts more widely in Paris, I just focused in on the Dominicans because mm. there seemed to be a lot of uh, interrelations between them. What's fascinating is, I think, to have been able to use these manuscripts to reconstruct you know, individual scribal biographies and um, communities of, of notators working mm -hmm. in 13th century Paris. It's really fascinating. And this was the last question that I have, is to ask well, what comes next as you come towards the end of your PhD? Can you see new projects coming from this? Yeah. I can see two projects potentially emerging from this, um, sort of building on this, but going off in their own directions. Firstly, I've, I've identified a certain number of professional notators in Paris, and um, it would be really interesting to see where else they were working. Do they come up in other manuscripts that have survived? Obviously, we're at the mercy of um, how many manuscripts have made it through to today. So I think it could be really interesting to establish um, a, a sort of network and uh, biography of the different notators that were um, active in Paris in the 13th century, what kind of manuscripts they were notating, and did they work in particular groups or anything like that, which I haven't found so far um, by just focusing on the Dominican manuscripts. So that would be one potential project. A second thing that I think could be really useful for um, studies of notated manuscripts is that, um, as I mentioned, square chant notation was used um, from the 13th century, it kind of emerged almost in the 12th century, but it was used, then used um, to a greater or lesser extent across Europe um, for the coming centuries as long as they continued to write uh, manuscripts, mm -hmm. uh, so into the 16th, 17th centuries. Mm -hmm. Yet, at the moment, we just describe this notation as square chant notation without um, any uh, variation as to when it was written or where. And um, a really interesting project, I think, would be to study these, this notation over a, a longer period of time in a, a larger geographical region and try and work out what are the typical traits of a particular notation from um, you know, a certain time and a certain place and see if we can build up a, a picture of, of how notation uh, changed over time and in, in different places. This would be really useful um, when studying music manuscripts because then you'd be able to say, oh well this one it's got notation from this place or from and this period and that would help us um, pinpoint when manuscripts were made and also if manuscripts were added to if they've got additions or marginalia then we might be able to say oh well this manuscript must have traveled to this place or you know it's got a scribe who's been in France now mm. now in Spain or something so it seems like a huge gap that needs filling as well yeah. so and two amazing projects to come out of uh, one amazing project already <laughs> so thank you so much Eleanor for coming to talk You're to us today welcome. it's been a real pleasure to have you Thanks for listening to this Cambridge PhD cast presented by me, John Gallagher, and produced by Richard Blakemore and Ruth Rushworth, and produced in association with Crash. If you'd like to hear more from us and for our fantastic collection of PhD casters, please visit the Crash website at crash, that's with two S's, dot C-A-M dot A-C dot U-K. Thank you for listening.